So there were some positive things that we saw, um, but it was different, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about that just so people would understand why the 70s were a a time of real expansion for Scientology. Like, right. no, like no nonsense. I mean, there were a lot of people coming right. in. And that was, the, I believe, its period of its greatest growth. Yeah. Right? And, and, and like we've talked about, you know, you had uh, this experience in the early 80s where Carl Barney and the Sea Org, you know, the mission holders in the Sea Org are starting to butt heads. They're bitching about each other. They're complaining. Because while well, you were hearing Carl Barney and the mission holders talk about that's what was going on at the Sea Org, too. I'm sure. You know, I mean, they I'm hated sure. these guys, yeah. right? And there was a point where we were aware that the orgs uh, definitely resented the Mission Network. Mm. Yeah, there was a point where I remember that happening. Yeah. And it's interesting because Hubbard's policies say the orgs are supposed to be the professional places, the top-notch places, the the guys where... You know, you could always, technically, they were superior, right? There was this whole superior org image sort of policy, but in the real world... It was the opposite. Exactly. And And we knew it. Right. What do you do with that? Right. Well, check this out. The missions were run, or managed, I should say, by the Sea Org, uh, or at least the management structure that existed for for the missions was like two or three people. The management structure that existed for the orgs was hundreds of people, sea organization members. Wow. And the orgs were being micromanaged, like they still are, while the missions were pretty much left in the hands right. of the mission holders. Right. And when the mission holders were competent, right. successful businessmen yeah. who knew what they were doing, yeah. they flourished. Yeah. The orgs never flourished because they're run by right. people who don't know what they're doing. Right. And being micromanaged by L. Ron Hubbard's directions right. that this is how you're supposed to do things. Well, I mean, looking back on that, too, um, I don't want to say that the mission holders were all these little um, cherubs and, you know, Right. I was going to ask you girls. about that. Yeah, because they, they, they weren't. weren't. <laughs> they weren't. <laughs> no. They were fighting for their place in the Scientology hierarchy of some kind or another. They had a good thing going, and they knew it. And they, they were... In, competition with each other but friendly competition um the orgs was a whole nother matter um but i remember barney kind of toward the end of my time there was uh trying he was floating around the idea and maybe he even went farther than that about offering uh finances for people who are taking um Scientology um, mission services, services. Yeah. and that would have been a big conflict that that would not have been okay right. but he would I think he would have found a way to try to do that which, oh yeah you know wasn't all right so that was just the only thing that I can think about and if he was doing it I can't imagine that some of the other guys weren't considering it too oh absolutely one of the one of the things actually that I know is the mission holders, by the way, we haven't really totally defined that, but that's the person who actually gets the rights from mm-hmm. Scientology officially to use the trademarks and copyrights of Scientology and deliver these services. And what they were supposed to do, um, correct me if I'm wrong, was send up 10% yeah. as tithing or so. something, I right? So. Like, like just straight right off the top, 10% of the money goes up to Hubbard, right? And in fact... The way it was set up was the franchises. They were originally called franchises, not mm-hmm. missions, right? Like, yeah. like McDonald's franchises. And they were set up that way so that the money went straight to Hubbard. So there was actually a legal liability when this thing came out with them setting up a credit union, setting up their own credit union, and setting up their own financial system with loans and things like this, setting up their own little bank. This legal liability would have connected straight to Hubbard. Oh, and yeah. he was already in hiding because yeah. he had been, yeah. you know, right. uh, 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 what's the word? Convicted in absentia in France for fraud. Yeah. He was running from the IRS. I mean, he was running. See, we didn't know. Right. We didn't know any about that. You know, it was like what? Right. You know, there wasn't 
the internet wasn't what it is today. <laughs> there was no Cell internet phones then. <laughs> didn't exist except for doctors. Um, you know, there we were fed what we what they wanted us to know. Wow. So even though we knew about you know the raid, you know the I was just about to ask you about yeah, that. Yeah, sure, we knew about that, but we thought they were. We thought that was terrible. All of those confessionals, all of those PC folders, you know, and we went, oh my God, that's a terrible thing to do. How can they do that? Right. Anyway, this, so this, they were the this, bad guys. This was the 77 raid yeah. by the FBI. Yeah. In, in, so they uh, were the bad yeah. guys. We were the good guys. Uh, we were trying to get church status, you know, state by state by state. And we, that was a big fight. And we wanted to, you know, make sure that that happened. And so when it didn't happen or happened fast enough, we were just like, oh, those bad guys, they just don't get us. Anyway, uh, so there was right. a lot of the idealism that we also had. But 